Welcome to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein, Quick Hitter Edition. We're going to go out to New York City and we're going to address the nexus point between Harold Daggett, the longshoreman union boss, and the New York La Cosa Nostra. Uh, and when we're talking about Daggett and the mob, we we're talking about Daggett and the Genovese crime family, specifically the boss of all bosses, Barney Bolo. And I think that's been a little bit underreported. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot in the news about Harold Daggett and his mob connections lately. Um, there's quite a bit of court filings out there that color it up. Um, I'm going to give a little backstory there, but I don't want to go over stuff that has you know already been in the news or other platforms have discussed some of the broad strokes. Um, I want to make sure that my audience, you know, which I think is a more discerning audience, um, gets the the whole enchilada and um, not just the cliff note bullet points you can find in a Google search. So the ILA is on strike. Um, this is a developing story. It it could um, it could get out of hand if this thing goes on for a while. Uh, it could really disrupt the supply chain here in our country. Uh, and whether or not he's a convicted felon or not, and he's not, Harold Daggett, I don't think it's a overstatement for modern times to make the analogy to him being a modern day Jimmy Hoffa, just not the face of the Teamsters, uh, the face of the dock workers. And he controls, I believe, 40 ports, 45 ports, um, coast to coast, has 50,000 plus uh, membership. And just like Hoffa, with one phone call, one push of a button, this country could come to a standstill. Um, and just like Hoffa, Daggett was put into place, um, allegedly, by the mafia and by the upper echelon of the elite, the elite of the elite, the Genovese crime family, and Chin Giganti and his protege, Barney Bologna. Um Chin is the, you know, the quintessential Genovese uh, mafia Don archetype the guy that kind of took mafia boss um, acumen to a different level in terms of the bait and switch. And you think, you know, the, the smoke and mirrors of you think the power is over here on the right when in fact it's actually to the left and then to the left of that center and then to the right of that left center. Um, and Barney Bolomo's a, a, a mob don built in that same image and was personally tapped by the chin. And the story that I'm going to tell right now and, and report on is, you know, this was one of the chin's final acts, the major acts as a, as a godfather. And one of Barney's first major, you know, kind of coups, if you will, to get Daggett into power. And it wasn't uh, a, something that took a year or, or, two years or five years or 10 years. I mean, this is, this is real gamesmanship. You know, this is chess. Uh, and, and Daggett, you know, was put into the machine more than a decade before he actually took power um, and became president. So he was, it was decided upon um, based on my sourcing and government documents I got my hand on, as well as Daggett's indictment from 2004. Now, Daggett beat that case in, in 05. So he's not, again, he's not a convicted felon, but he was con uh, he was indicted for racketeering and labor, uh, labor union racketeering and working as a puppet on the behalf of the Genovese crime family. He beat those charges 20 years ago. But let's kind of paint the whole picture here and based on again people i've spoken to 
uh, on the west side, as well as law enforcement, as well as reading through a lot of these documents. It looks like the decision that Daggett was going to be the future president of ILA was made around 94, 95. He didn't take power until I think 07. Um, there was a meeting that we all know about from, you know, again, a quick Google search. You can find that there was a meeting that took place in the summer of 1999 where John Bowers, who was his uh, predecessor as the boss of the union, um, was told that it, his time was running out and that he was being asked quite, um, you know, with, with not a lot of finesse was being told that he had to leave, whether or not he was ready to leave or not, it didn't matter. They wanted him out. They wanted to dag it in. Um, but Barney Belomo and Vincent Chinjagante made this decision together in 94, 95. Now, Barney went away in 96. Um, didn't get, didn't come home again until the 2000s. Chin got locked up in 97 and never came home. He died uh, in, in the years to come. So this was this was at the really at the end of that era and when the changing of the guard was kind of in the in the queue at that point. Um, but it was a a progression where they would find different openings to insert Daggett into different spots that would gradually pull him up the ladder. Um, and if you look at the way that uh, the votes came down at these Teamster, or sorry, Teamster, I apologize, at these ILA conventions, um, and it's all laid out in the court documents and 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 some of these other government intelligence uh, records that I have. Every vote was unanimous. Um, so he was able to get up into every spot simply by the Genovese telling the ILA that this was going to happen. And, uh, you know, there's some other kind of you know, inside baseball for, for people that really, you know, keep a scorecard for who's who in each family. It's interesting to see that um, the names of Pasquale Falsetti, a.k.a. Uncle Patty, the name Danny Bagano, um, come up in these court filings. Uh, Ernie Muscarella, um, you know, names of big time players today. Uh, and these were references to what was going on in the 90s. So I know that based on these documents, if you're going to believe these documents, again, these are just, these are things that were not proven in court. I want to be very clear, but um, this is what the government asserts. Patty Falsetti was doing all of the liaisoning between Barney and Chin and the people that were being told that they had to put Daggett into power. And if you go to Gangster Report this week, I'm going to have a breakdown of the specifics of the timeline of how he got into power and what meetings took place at what dates, at what places, with who, um, and then the uh, subsequent um, convention elections and who he was talking to and who he was meeting with. And Daggett, um, you know, even recently, uh, according to some intelligence uh, documents I have from the FBI, has been seen at uh, social clubs connected to high ranking members of the Genovese, including Danny Pagano's East Bronx Soccer Club. Um, Balsetti was going back and forth between New York and Miami in the 90s uh, to try to lay all the foundation, plant all the seeds on behalf of the Genovese administration to get Daggett into power. Um, there was one uh, meeting that took place where Daggett told Falsetti um, to say help. This was back in 95, I think, or 96, said, uh, say hello to the, as they were leaving a meal where they had, they had talked about some of these ways that they were going to 
um, get Daggett more power. He said, give my uh, love and appreciation and say hi to the, to our friend in the Bronx. And the FBI interpreted that to mean Barney Bowen. Um So I just wanted to be clear on, on how he got there as opposed to now what's going on. And yes, we know he's mobbed up and, but I, I think it's important to know, but he, but he's a guy that started to make his name in the, in the ILA back in the seventies as a, fierce uh, striker, uh, you know, a guy that, you know, this guy, you just, you Google him, go on YouTube, you know, uh, well, you're on YouTube now, but you know, uh, find uh, ways to, to see him uh, in, in uh, either being interviewed or giving talks. He is quite uh, uh, pugnacious, I think is a word that might be accurate, quite, um, you know, he was, he's a gritty guy um, who lives a, a, a quite a for a union boss he lives a very luxurious existence and that's been talked about in in the press uh in the last couple of days so but i just want to i'll conclude by saying that there's some narrative out there based on what's been written about daggett uh having a kind of a emotional breakdown might be the best way to say it uh, on the stand at his uh, fall 2005 Rico trial and um, talking about how he wet himself uh, the first time or one of the first times he met uh, Genovese uh, mobster and, and union leg breaker, Georgie Barone, AKA Georgie, the jet, uh, that Georgie the Jet put a gun to his head in 1980, uh, threatened to, to kill him on the spot, and that he pissed his pants. And that he said this all while on the stand getting emotional. And there are some people out there that are casting dispersions on Daggett because of because of that and, and saying that that is representative of, of him not really being a tough guy and that it's all an act. Well. It's actually the other way around. Um, what he did on the stand was an act that was performative. Um, and it worked. He got acquitted. And 20 years later, he's the most powerful union boss in the country right now, arguably. So he wasn't crying on the stand because he couldn't control his emotions. He, he was playing the jury. Um, and believe me, Harold Daggett is as tough as they come. Um, so I just want to be clear that, that the, perf the performance on the stand in 05, um, really does not represent in any way, shape or form who Harold Daggett is. If it does represent it, it represent him as, uh, again, as a guy who plays chess and <laughs> knew what he had to do to get off on, on those charges. So um, Georgie Bruin ended up being one of the witnesses that in that case, uh, Georgie Bruin flipped um, after he got into a beef with the Gigante, specifically Andrew um, and, you know, ruined his reputation. He had had a epic reputation in New York and ended up, uh, you know, kind of going, leaving with his tail between his legs. But uh Believe me, Harold Daggett is no one to be trifled with. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, I'm out.